the good and the bad of business. Let's talk with a nationally known expert, Joe Lawless, from the University of Washington's Milgard School of Business in Tacoma. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, good and bad of business. Uh, this is corporate social responsibility, a squishy word, right? It is. It, it's, it's a squishy word and an evolving word. What is it? I define corporate social responsibility as the things that a firm does that make it sustainable. What is sustainability? Because I hear that word a lot. The trick to that word is, and I always like to ask other people, what do you mean? When people use it, I like to ask them, what do you mean? Because I find that people use that term very differently. When I use it, I use it in its broadest context. So sustainable from a financial standpoint, sustainable from uh, an employee standpoint, labor relations, uh, supply chain, how you're treating people throughout throughout your operations, uh, sustainable from an uh, environmental standpoint, from a carbon footprint standpoint. It, it, there's a lot of different, it's all of that, how you engage with your community, how you um, support your community. You know, business can't be successful in communities that are failing. Do we care? I mean, do, does business care about any of those things as long as somebody pays for their Diet Coke? I think they do care, and increasingly they care. Um, because because consumers are changing, because consumers want companies to demonstrate values that align with theirs. The consumer's availability of information is changing. We, we have a instant access to information about companies, both good and bad. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some, a company does something good, within 15 minutes it's, it's spread around the world. Uh, the flip side of that coin for firms is you do something bad uh, and in 15 minutes it's spread around the world. So firms it, care. Too. One of the things that the, the public had a huge impact on was smoking. Uh, smoking yeah. used to be common everyday uh, you know, kinds of things. And, and yes, it, while it may have been uh, stopped as a result of, of health impact, the public still had to deal with years of companies pushing back and saying it's okay, mm -hmm. but they changed it. And, and I think that had a lot to do with the availability of information. You know, in terms of the bad side of CSR, companies tried to keep that information from the public. Yeah. Uh, I'd be curious if they could still do that today. Keep information uh, <laughs> from the public? The way that they did back, back when they were doing that. Mm -hmm. I think because of the democratization of information through technology, we're, our access to information is so much uh, more instantaneous and broad. Uh, so I don't think they would be able to do it the way that they did uh, and in those times. Well, we're going to talk about some individual companies, um, and we're going to actually talk about some universities as well. Uh, because there's some interesting things that are happening. And unfortunately, the interest part is kind of negative. But before we go there, let's talk about you just a little bit. I talked about you as a, as a national leader uh, on the good and the bad of business. And in fact, right as we speak, you're in the process of bringing people, certainly from around the nation, to come to Tacoma, Washington to talk about social responsibility in business. I'm the executive director of the Center for Leadership and Social Responsibility. Uh, in the Milgard School of Business. And what that means uh, is that we look at curriculum and the work that we do with curriculum. We have a minor in corporate responsibility now that uh, our students can, along with their marketing major or even you know, environmental studies or nursing or technology major, can get a minor in corporate responsibility. Another student-focused thing that we do is our case competition. Uh, where we have, we'll have, right now we have 17 teams around the world actually uh, reviewing a case on Microsoft's use of uh, artificial intelligence to enhance their corporate social responsibility uh, initiatives uh, globally. Hmm. Boy, that's going to be interesting to see. It will. And as well as, this is more than about universities, but just from, the, from Leeds University, just from earlier this month, said a company's success is measured by its bottom line, and, but how do you measure acting responsibly? And here's what they're teaching in England. They said that managers can no longer hide behind large corporate legal teams if they're caught acting unethically. 
students understand for their own and for their company's interest that managers must take responsibility for their actions. Almost sounds like anarchy, though. I think, actually, I, the, the fact that it's out of uh, England, um, I believe from a corporate responsibility standpoint, European com companies uh, and universities are probably 10 years ahead of the U.S. I think that in business schools, um, though, and I think this is becoming increasingly true in the U.S., though, we do have to teach our students uh, that corporate responsibility isn't some add-on program. It's an office, you know, over in that corner. It's that guy's responsibility, as opposed to that, that it's strategic that this is part of business strategy. This is who we are, this is what we do. Uh, and we can integrate uh, all of these types of CSR programs into our corporate strategy. Well, let's talk about some things that are happening right now. Yeah. Uh, very, very recently, there was a huge scandal coming out of the Olympics uh, and uh, Michigan State University uh, over a history of, of sex abuse. And at the same point in time, there is a, a scandal that the FBI has gotten involved in, in bribery in college sports, particularly in college basketball. Um, I got to ask you, are the managers potentially going to jail because of those activities? I mean, bribery is illegal. Mm -hmm. Sex abuse is illegal. Yes, absolutely. I think, I think there will be people going to jail. I don't know that that is necessarily indicative of cultures within those organizations, though. Um, when you have a big, big organization, you're always going to have people who do bad things. They exist. They exist in the world. Um, the more cynical side of me says that they exist more than we would like. Uh, but the issue for organizations and as managers is when you find out about it, when you know about it, do you do the right thing? We saw at Michigan State, maybe they didn't. We know at Penn State a few years ago, right. again, out of, out of uh, college sports, we know they didn't. And, and I think those, it's interesting, those two, those two worlds colliding, the child abuse issues and, and college sports, um, in that people oftentimes don't believe kids and they want to believe because I work with uh, this person and they're a good person they're good you know they're good to me I, I don't know them as that they don't want to believe it when kids uh, bring up allegations of abuse oh is there one industry rather than another that is more fraught with peril of uh, bad bad company bank activity uh, financial services uh, firms for example in the 2008 debacle um, Morgan Stanley was a company that won awards for corporate social responsibility, yet <laughs> you, you raise right. up the hood. Right, right. I think that uh, it, that has to do with leadership. I told you I run the Center on Leadership and Social Responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it's because Gary Milgard, when he set this up, um, said, I don't think you can separate the two. And more and more I understand what he meant that you can't be a good leader without being socially responsible, and you can't be socially responsible without being a good leader. Who are some of the most responsible companies out there? Let's, let's talk about a good yeah. one and a bad one. Yeah, I just wrote this case and that all of our students are working on this weekend with Microsoft. Their TechSpark initiative, which is really five initiatives to bring technology to change people's lives in rural communities. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've done that in Africa, they've done that in Asia. Yeah. Uh, they literally have saved lives and they've changed the way uh, women become economic powers where they're right. not even powers at all. Right, and they are, they are approaching it from the standpoint of constantly, how can we do this better? How can we take this, you know, in growing area of you know, big data and artificial intelligence and how can we apply that to this so, you know, the social problems that exist in, uh, in the world. Uh, and I think that is an extremely socially responsible thing to do. And it's part of their DNA. It's part of who they are and how they approach uh, business. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but it, it, uh, it's demonstrated in all that they do. They also were one of the first, if not the first firm, to incentivize managers to reduce their carbon footprints. They put a financial number to the carbon footprint of each individual business unit and back charge companies to, uh, um, or back charge managers, uh, which 
aligns your incentives with what you're saying you want to accomplish. It's easy for a firm to say, we want to reduce our carbon footprint. But if you don't align your incentives at the management level with those, it's not going to happen. And so from a systemic standpoint, it seems that Microsoft's going in the right direction. Right. But then you look at another company, Volkswagen. From a systemic standpoint, they weren't going in the right direction. They weren't. And it wasn't just a, a case of a few bad actors. It was systemic. Um, as we came to, to know, it was systemic throughout the organization. It was known. It was um, hidden. Um, it was purposeful. It, that is different. That is a very different thing from a few bad people doing something and the company uncovers it, which is really about leadership. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a company like Walmart where you look at Walmart and a lot of people have a very bad taste in their mouth about Walmart because of questionable uh, employee practices. But then you look at their energy consumption and all that they've done from an advancement standpoint there, and they're really very good. So how yeah. do you look at Walmart? I look at Walmart as being, um, having the most opportunity. Uh, and I think that they want to do the right thing. I disagree with their strategy around employees. They have made significant impacts on energy usage which also reduce their costs. Mm -hmm. uh, they've made significant impacts in the products that they have in their store and uh, organic vegetables and kind of changing those markets. One good example of it is they went, they told their suppliers to reduce packaging. That's a, that's a good environmental impact. It's also good business mm -hmm. because Walmart at its core is really a product distribution company. If you can reduce the costs of distributing goods, it's a better business model. But when Walmart tells you to do something, you don't just do it for them, you do it for everyone. They can influence, they're the 800 pound gorilla that when they say we want this, they can change entire sectors. Um, and they're doing that. Let's talk about the trends for corporate social responsibility in 2018, and one of the first ones is the current social and political climate is leading to louder voices. Boy, that's for sure. Louder voices and um, the ability for those voices to be amplified. We have louder voices from consumers, from the public. We have louder voices in politics. We uh, are beginning to see louder voices, though, from the corporate sector. Companies are starting to take stands on issues. Specifically, the tragedy in Florida uh, with the guns. Teenagers in Florida are leading and are loud voices right now, but companies are listening to those teenagers. Companies are listening to those teenagers and they're starting to take action. Um, and they're being attacked for that from, from loud voices. Mm -hmm. um, Which companies? Uh, Delta Airlines, United Airlines, Enterprise Rental Car, which is a big group of uh, rental car companies. Uh, they have taken positions and said, we want to withdraw our support uh, on, on the NRA's website. Um, and they've taken some heat for that. I think that overall they will probably um, benefit though from the reputational impact that it will have for them. Uh, something else that's happening in 2018, Generation Z is joining the workforce. How is that going to impact how a company treats itself in the community. This younger generation wants to um, have their careers be impactful. They want to, more than other generations. Even more than millennials. Yes, I mean, more I than know we, we criticize millennials uh, and you know every generation is subject to being criticized. Right. But they want some changes too. Yeah, and I think, I think it started with millennials and it's, it is being amplified and um, concentrated with Generation Z. My observation of millennials, um, most of the stereotypes about them I don't find to be true. I see them in the classroom, and sure, there are some people that, uh, that carry those stereotypes. But for the most part, they are a very um, driven and caring group. Um, that's my observation of them in, in the classroom. Gen Z and millennials want their careers to make a difference. And companies are having to find ways to respond to that. Another aspect that companies are having to do in 2018 is that the public is demanding personalization. Uh, and is that a matter of corporate social responsibility or is that just good marketing? When Starbucks 
sees you come into the store and they know what you want and they've got it ready for you or mm -hmm. they don't know you but they have enabled you through technology to go ahead and text in your order. We will continue to see more personalization as technology allows for it. It is a good example though of a company that's working toward uh, personalization in a way that, um, that is socially responsible. And that's Nike. You know, Nike's current business model is produce, produce goods in mostly Southeast Asian countries and then put them on big ships and ship them around the world and sell them, stock them in stores and sell them. That is a very carbon intensive business model. Mm -hmm. um, and every, almost every product that Nike makes uh, is carbon based. Synthetic fibers are carbon based. Yeah, come even cotton, of. even cotton. Uh, is dependent on carbon as fertilizer and um, so much of its carbon based so they are they are looking at they're putting tons of emphasis on alternative uh, materials alternative materials alternative manufacturing processes and I think that eventually you will see uh, personalized manufacturing that is decentralized uh, happening so you'll as opposed to going to a big store where they have a thousand pairs of shoes and you choose your one shoe, you go online and you'll build your shoe that will get manufactured within a 500 mile radius of your home and then shipped to you. The personalization that largely could be responsive to uh, customer demand is also something that is more socially responsible right. because of its less impact on the environment. Yeah. And that's what Generation Z and the Millennials are requiring. Right, exactly. Excellent. The other thing is the Sustainable Development Goals. They come out of the United Nations. Survey recently of the top, the Fortune 50 world companies, mm -hmm. that more than half of them were on board with the new Sustainable Development Goals. And many of those companies are in the extractive uh, business. They're oil companies, transportation companies, uh, mining companies. Right. I can't see an extractive being socially responsible, but they are. It's kind of a dilemma. <laughs> um, if you're if you're extracting extracting uh, energy, extracting materials uh, in a way that um, exploits populations, you can change that. Um, you're still extracting materials. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the SDGs are designed to um, minimize impact, negative impacts but they'll never be able to totally do away with negative impacts of the extractive industries. Well, every animal has some kind of negative impact right. on its environment, yeah. uh, and also probably positive impact as well. Let's talk about the oil companies, though, for a minute. Um, Chevron, for example, mm -hmm. is, is a company that is an, is an extractive if there ever was one, yet they are moving into more and more of uh, the renewable energies. Yeah. Uh, smart business, sure. Is it uh, socially responsible? What drives it? I think what drives it is uh, they know. <laughs> they, they know, I mean, they understand uh, the cost per unit of extraction has been increasing. It is more and more expensive to extract uh, fossil fuels from the earth. That is just a truth. And they know that. And that curve is not going to change and it's going to continue to uh, increase actually from a business model standpoint they understand better than anyone that they need to be out in front of that curve and start finding alternatives uh, if they want to stay alive talk about leadership and the relationship between leadership and social responsibility a couple of leaders that you mentioned to me before uh, the show uh, are the uh, the former leader of, of Patagonia and then Lawrence Fink who is the leader at uh, um, BlackRock right now. Yeah. How are they socially responsible leaders? I gave you those two very different examples. Yvonne Chavard is um, privately, you know, Patagonia's privately held company. He has put his personal values on that brand uh, and lived it through that brand. Fink recently came out and he, he manages BlackRock and they, he has the ability, just as Walmart does, because they are the largest money manager on the planet uh, control the most assets which means you have the ability to move markets so he has said 
basically we are going to, through our ability in the boardroom and through voting, we are going to require firms to be socially responsible. That is socially responsible unto itself. It's also a smart business. Being socially responsible is about risk. And if BlackRock knows anything, it's that risk is, is how they make money and managing risk. Being socially irresponsible uh, could possibly be more financially uh, um, beneficial in the short term. But over the long term, there's been multiple studies that have shown that being socially responsible is much more um, productive in the long term. Well, you've got other companies out here. I mean, the biggest companies, uh, Google. Uh, the CEO of Google, uh, Sundar Pichai, uh, is believed to be a very responsible person. Yeah. Uh, Indra Nooyi of PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. uh, again, she's believed to be very responsible. Disney, another company. Uh, Mark Benioff from Salesforce. Yeah. Yeah. All of these companies where you look at leadership and social responsibility is all over them. Yeah. Um, have we bypassed now the age where the smoke-filled room was where things got done and instead now it's, it's transparent and it is responsible. I think so. I think especially from a leadership standpoint in from a management standpoint, I don't know yet that we've seen that shift occur in the boardroom. Mm. And I think that is, that is a lagging Why do you think that is? leadership change. Could it be because the, the boardroom is, is, the people in the boardroom are usually shareholders and they have the largest financial stake in the company? It, it could be. I think that it's probably more related, although BlackRock is in the boardroom, uh, yeah. and what they are saying is we understand that being socially responsible is better for an organization in the long term, and we want you to be socially responsible for, to manage risk. So I think it's starting to shift, but I think that is the slowest place for it to um, for it to change. A few years ago when I was working in social responsibility at Symmetra Financial, um, I was uh, talking with a pharmaceutical company, the president of a pharmaceutical company, about partnering with us on a, a, a CSR initiative. His response to me is that when we become profitable, we'll be able to be socially responsible. <laughs> I was dumbfounded. Right. Um, are there, again, going back to industries, is the pharmaceutical industry one that can't be socially responsible. I, I think that they have to be socially responsible. I think that every uh, firm ultimately has to be socially responsible. And, and because, if, especially from a shareholder standpoint, what always happens with these companies that end up doing bad things uh, is the managers walk away enriched uh, and the shareholders are the ones that, that uh, kind of- Take it in the shorts. Take it in the shorts, yeah. It's not well, specifically, <laughs> I'm thinking of is the opioid crisis. Right. Um, there are three companies kind of at the top in the pharmaceutical distribution. There's Amerisource, Bergen, Cardinal, mm -hmm. uh, and McKesson. Yep. And those three companies, um, you know, I'm not revealing anything here. This is very, very public. Mm -hmm. Are they, by continuing to distribute opioids, socially irresponsible? I think so. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> There are some things that I'm not sure about. That's one that I'm absolutely sure about because so, I see the results of it on the streets every day and what it's doing to our society. And that is no mystery. They have known about this, just as the tobacco industry knew what was happening with, with uh, cigarettes. They have known about this. And I think it's very irresponsible to, to uh, do that. Is there a place for painkillers in in the practice of medicine, absolutely. But physicians are being encouraged to prescribe 40, 50, 60 pills when five or six might do. Mm. Um, medicine is something, and, we, and we've done a lot of shows about that. Medicine mm -hmm. is something where that has changed is, and is getting ready to change dramatically. Yeah. But companies have made a living for decades off of the way it is. Yeah. Uh, is it socially irresponsible to hang on to the old ways when new ways are making people healthier? Absolutely. Uh, because, because hanging on to the old ways is about uh, kind of personally enriching management. 
because I don't think that is in the shareholders' best interest. We've come almost to the end of the show. Uh, what is the corporate social responsibility going to look like in five years? It, it'll be much more accepted. Uh, I think that it will be talked about a lot more. I think that within organizations it will no longer be the office of corporate social responsibility. It will be part of who organizations are. I think that artificial intelligence and big data and the ability to apply that in the realm of social responsibility is going to be hugely impactful uh, on the ways that firms engage their values into the value of their products and their services that they're providing and how they tell those stories and the ability to connect individually one-on-one -on -one, and personalize messages with this new generation of younger um, younger workers younger consumers uh, who want that Joe Lawless thank you very much for being with us thank you